Ontario will be something new, not so much. Uh, I appreciate all of you coming. I'm Larry Sorrell, I'm the relatively new executive director, CEO of uh, New York State Zoo. And I certainly want to thank Mark Irwin, uh, one, the chair of our board, and two, uh, the professor here at uh, JCC for partnering with us to present the first of what our intent is to become a regular series of speakers on various topics of interest to both us and JCC, all related to, uh, in one way or another, the zoo world or conservation, or maybe even straying a little bit into education. So Dr. Jeff Wyatt um, is the inaugural speaker of this series, has yet to be named, we have to figure that out. Uh, and he is um, currently, his primary appointment is with the University of Rochester for Six years. Six years. Six years. Medicine, yeah. um, and was our, um, our was the vet at uh, Seneca Park Zoo in Rochester. Um, started there 20 something? So 35 years 35 ago. 35 years ago. Okay. Um, and then over the, I was there um, starting in 1987 until <coughs> I came up here. And during the course of our time together, we um, started and Jeff really took took the, the bull by the horns and really grew a conservation program uh, to the point where after he had to change his title from um, consulting vet to director of animal health and conservation, animal health conservation and research actually. Um, so he's here to talk today a little bit about uh, one how we got into that, uh, the importance of conservation as it relates to the world in general and the zoo world in. in Particular, and the importance of local conservation using this big fish as the model, but also um, talking a little bit about the other local conservation opportunities. <coughs> so, that would be a good well, thank you, Larry. Thank you all for coming. I we see familiar faces here. I've been um, working with the Watertown Zoo for a, a while, off and on, visiting. I, we have Utica Zoo friends that have visited us. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this will be very informal. I want to be sure that if there are any questions, I see a lot of students here who may have an interest working in conservation science or conservation biology. And I think I could really help you as you were uh, looking at pathway options. But tonight I'm really gonna focus on a big fish story. I've got a story, it's such a success story. I could talk for hours and hours on this. I will probably only talk for about 45 minutes. Uh, this is a story that you normally hear of gloom and doom when, you, when you're thinking about conservation science. You know, we live in a world where, where we're uh, worried about the environment, we're worried about ecosystem health, environmental health. Being affiliated with uh, JCC and a conservation program with animals or with a zoo, we're trying to convey hope for our guests, for our visitors, for our families, for ourselves, for our communities, that we can promote a healthier, biodiverse environment. We found a mascot for that. We found an ambassador for hope. And our ambassador is this fish. This fish has turned Rochester around as it relates to ecosystem health. And I know that you have uh, these, this fish on exhibit at the, at the zoo here too. The, the big message I also want to convey is that in order to, to accomplish anything with conservation science, you need to involve the community. You need community investment, community awareness, and it doesn't matter if you're working in Rochester, New York, in Watertown, New York, or in a faraway place like Indonesia where we're doing very similar programming with forests and orangutans. The sturgeon in Rochester, the sturgeon is our orangutan. And instead of a forest, we're talking about the river. But it's all about local stakeholders who care about the environment and how we can listen to the local stakeholders on how to improve the environment. One of the new terms that we are using now is called planetary health. And especially for young students who are looking for a career pathway, I encourage you to look at Planetary Health Alliance. P-H-A. Check it out. It's a huge new initiative between Rockefeller Foundation, the, 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 the Wildlife Conservation Society, the Bronx Zoo System, 
in Harvard University. And any zoo, any academic institution, JCC, Watertown Zoo, can be a member of the Planetary Health Alliance. It doesn't cost anything to be a member of the Planetary Health Alliance. What it requires is telling the story of the interconnectedness between our behavior, humans, and the environment and the impact it has on wildlife and on domestic animals. The interconnectedness of human health, animal health, habitat health. That's ecosystem health, that's planetary health. The sturgeon has really changed the way Rochester looks at the Genesee River. We now have a renewed pride in the river. We have kayakers in the river. We have more waterfront activity. And I'm, I'm attributing it all to our sturgeon. We've been working with this program now for about 15 years, and we have a healthier river, so says our sturgeon. We also have connected our river with public health. The fish that we may be consuming in the river may not be that safe to consume. They may not have a very healthy life themselves. We don't know. We've learned a lot by inviting our sturgeon to answer some of those questions. So if we can invite a sentinel animal that will help us understand ecosystem health, you know what, that's probably <clears throat> foreshadowing for our health, for our community health. And to better understand how the animals in our world are living and thriving will really reflect on our future as well. So we may have a selfish reason for understanding how happy these fish are in the wild. Very importantly, we're demonstrating a story on how science can save species. In a world now where we're not really following scientific progress, we may have more, more fluffy information that really is anecdotal, that isn't really that accurate. We have a science-based story with metrics that no one could argue with that helps us understand, because of our sturgeon, how the Genesee River and our environment is healthier. And as importantly, we want to promote stewardship of the environment. You, stu you students were at some point like these little kids, so we all were, and we all had pivotal life experiences that changed the direction that we take in our career, in our life, in our attitudes. We are impacting children in Rochester and everywhere we promote our sturgeon story to care about the watershed, to care about the river, and to very importantly care about how we may be impacting the river with our behavior. The Great Lakes, that's in our backyard. The Great Lakes, 21% of the world's surface freshwater. 21% of the world's surface freshwater in our Great Lakes. This wonderful treasure that we must protect. And there are also kind of selfish reasons to protect it too. Tens of millions of people use the Great Lakes for their drinking water, both in Canada and the United States. Tens of millions of people. Four billion dollars of money a year goes into and is earned through recreational fishing. Four billion dollars a year recreational fishing, the Great Lakes. That's, that's the economic model for some countries, and it's all in our Great Lakes. Also incredible navigation channels. These Great Lakes are super special, and we need to protect those, and the sturgeon is helping us understand that we're, we're, we're coming back with the health of our Great Lakes. Well, if you don't know where Rochester, New York is, it's, uh, it's between here and Buffalo. It's on Lake Ontario. It's on the southern shore of Lake Ontario. We are a canal town. We were one of the first boom towns in New York State because the Erie Canal cut right through Rochester. And more importantly to me, the Genesee River cuts right through Rochester. So it has a beautiful long history of a respect for the, our waterways. As you probably will learn more as your career unfolds or as we work more together, we can't accomplish anything alone. We need partnerships. We need the scientists from U.S. Geological Survey, from the Department of Environmental Conservation. We at Seneca Park Zoo need those scientists. We don't have a staff. We need the University of Rochester School of Medicine and Dentistry, where they have scientists who know more about 
uh, endocrinology and pollutants and chemical contaminants. We zoos are the voice for those scientists. And if you uh, are looking to advance science in your community, especially as students, think about working at a zoo. You can really be impactful with the community and zoos are more and more advancing field conservation, science conservation biology for all the right reasons in many ways to help give us more purpose. That our animals under our care are conveying a strong conservation message, giving them more purpose and giving us more purpose in our careers too. In a Jefferson Community College, County College, Community College, same thing. Advancing your career pathways through a novel way. I think Mark said we're stronger together, working together as a community college and as a zoo. And that, that couldn't be truer. This is the lower falls of Genesee River. It looks like the Pacific Northwest. We are built on, we have three waterfalls in our downtown area in Rochester. This is the lower falls. We love the river. I love the river. Uh, we haven't been so kind to the river. In fact, we've been terrible to the river, especially we European exploiters. We who moved here a couple of centuries ago, uh, maybe it's a conquest, I don't know what we would call it, but we uh, weren't so kind to the river. 5,000 years before Europeans settled in this area, 5,000 years, think of that, Native Americans lived in this river system. They revered the sturgeon, they protected the river for 5,000 years. It took us about 200 years to change all that. And here's the key, we can change it back. We have an opportunity and I think a requirement to change it back. And this is the story how we can do that. So the gloom and doom is behind, behind us, almost. I wanna tell you a little bit more. So after, um, after we arrived, we uh, found that these sturgeon were more of an annoyance to us. We would throw our nets out into the lake, catching Lake Herring. Herring is a very big commercial product for the fishing industry back in the 1800s. And we were so annoyed by these sturgeon that they messed up our nets and they were this big that we would throw them on the beach and dry them out and discard them and not care about them. Until it occurred to somebody, you could burn them. You could burn them, you could use them to fuel the steamboats going back and forth from Canada to the United States. Easier to dry out a sturgeon than cut a tree down. They were that numerous and that annoying to the fishermen, drying them up on the beach. So that was a problem until we made it worse. And, you know, and, and, we, and we are going to change all this, so it's not too awful, but I'm going to be not so nice about it, us. We uh, tasted one. And oh my goodness, they are delicious. And they're illegal to possess, illegal to consume, uh, but we found them so delicious that we um, pretty much ate them to extinction. We overfished. And uh, there's another sturgeon in the Hudson River that is called the Albany Beef, because there was a big Albany slaughterhouse that was working with processing sturgeon. The lake sturgeon had similar consumption in the Great Lakes where at the peak of consumption in the late 1800s, we harvested four million pounds of sturgeon one year. Four million pounds. And so we first burned them. Well, then we ate them all. And um, last but not least, um, when we reached over 1900, we were polluting our rivers. And we polluted the rivers and we um, damaged their spawning habitat. In some areas, we put up dams, which was not sturgeon friendly. So we've, uh, we people have really had negative impact up to now with our sturgeon. That's all changing. Not so long gone are the days where we may find a sturgeon that size. That's in the upper Niagara near Buffalo, New York. Uh, and not that long ago. We don't think we have sturgeon of that size anymore in the lower Niagara, upper Niagara, or in the St. Lawrence, but we're going to get there. We're going to get there. 
This is Rochester back in the day, back in the late 1800s, and it's not that different from other urban areas where we polluted the river system. And we have these chemical contaminants. These are called persistent chemical contaminants because they stay in the environment forever. Once they're in the environment, they recycle through animal life and then go back down into the sediment. And some of these are even man-made chemicals, and some uh, are not. Uh, mercury is the number one reason we have fish consumption advisories in the United States. Mercury was an airborne contaminant. When it rained in, all the mercury would get into our water and then go into our rivers. The Clean Air Act long ago uh, really impacted that, so mercury isn't, as, isn't a problem as far as introducing more, but it's there in the environment. Silver, well, being from Rochester, New York, where the Genesee River is our study site, we were quite interested in silver. Rochester, New York is the home of Kodak, our photographic industry. Silver is a byproduct from photography. Uh, luckily, silver doesn't have health consumption advisories. Nickel, the same thing. Cadmium is from batteries. PCBs, PCBs are a lubricant that's a man-made chemical banned in the 1970s but it was used in industry. We realized that we didn't need it anymore and it was horrible because it persisted in the environment. So we banned it, but it's still there in the environment. All of these chemicals have adverse health effects for people, and especially the unborn. They can adversely affect children, children in utero, adults, cancer risks for adults. So there are a lot of scary things that could happen to people being exposed to these chemicals, and also to our wildlife. Dioxins and furans are combustion byproducts. Again, another, another consequence of industry. And the last one's kind of really interesting, I think. It's called Myrex. And Myrex is an insecticide. Well, it also happens to be a flame retardant. An insecticide and a flame retardant. How weird is that? It's a man-made chemical. It was made primarily from an insecticide perspective to kill fire ants. Fire ants were a big problem in the southern United States, and so this insecticide was very popular. Well, it just so happens it's only found in Lake Ontario. None of the other Great Lakes have it, and here's why. There's a company that used to be called Hooker Chemical, and Hooker Chemical in Niagara Falls area, the Love Canal is kind of associated with that. Hooker Chemical made Myrex, and they also dumped Myrex in dumps near the, near, the, near the company. And as you know what a watershed is, eventually whatever is in the soil is going to end up in the river. It hit the Niagara River, this Myrex went down the Niagara River, over Niagara Falls, into Lake Ontario. And it's another one of those persistent chemicals, and it is in all of our fish, and it actually has been found in beluga whales beyond the St. Lawrence. It's been moving out, but it's in our Lake Ontario system. So it's another chemical of uh, important concern for human health. The EPA and the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative and the International Joint Council Commission between Canada and the United States in the 1980s identified what we call areas of concern. These are toxic hotspots. And Rochester's one, Detroit's one, Oswego's one, Toronto area's one. Any urban area on the Great Lakes, they all have a long history of pollution. So we're not alone if we happen to live in what's called an AOC, uh, but we don't want to be an AOC. We want that label off of us. It's bad, bad news. It can adversely affect your economy, your real estate, your health. So we want to do everything we can to try to remove that label. This is the Rochester area of concern. It's an embayment. So Rochester is Monroe County. We have our own wonderful community college in Monroe County as well. But it goes from pretty much across one side of the county to the other, uh, where that line is crossing over this embayment. And it also goes down the Genesee River, six miles of the Genesee River. The Genesee River flows from Pennsylvania all the way up through Rochester into Lake Ontario. So the area of concern is this area that has a long history of pollution and is believed to be chemically contaminated, unsafe for many reasons, and we want to change that. When you're an area of concern, you have 14 things on your to-do list to evaluate. These 14 things, especially if you're an animal lover, are pretty easy to understand. Tumors in animals, 
problems reproducing. Also beach closures, tainting of the water if it smells bad, if the fish smells bad, if you're going to consider eating it. Also phytoplankton and microscopic uh, life that is affected. So there are these 14 items on your to-do list if you're in an area of concern that you're supposed to try to address. We were trying to figure out, being a vet, what kind of animal would help us answer that question. And we thought, well, this was back in the 80s. We thought, well, hey, uh, you know, the bald eagle is kind of important. Everybody loves bald eagles. And they might be a good animal to see if we can see how they do as the river health improves. Then we thought, no way. Bald eagles aren't going to come back. And we were so wrong. They proved us wrong. Mother Nature will prove you wrong every time. Thank goodness. Well, we selected our sturgeon because the sturgeon was extirpated disappeared, was extinct from the Genesee River, which was the nursery for this fish. So it spends its baby life in the Genesee River, totally gone. So we figured, let's, let's select the sturgeon. And there are some other reasons that we selected the sturgeon. In addition to deserving to be back, because that's where they used to live, and that because of our behavior, they're extirpated. Well, they're also super interesting because, well, one thing, they live so long. The females live 150 years. The females live 150 years. This guy, whose name is Seth Green, Seth Green is the, not the actor. <laughs> Do y'all know who Seth Green is? Who's Seth Green? Aquaculture? Not the actor. <laughs> He's the grandfather of uh, aquaculture. And Seth Green uh, was from Rochester, New York. And we have an island in the Genesee River where we release the fish near Seth Green Island. Anyway, oh, that sturgeon, they live 150 years, the female. The males might live 85 years. Long, long time. They also are bottom feeders, so they might be able to tell us what's going on with the, uh, the water health, the chemistry, in the bottom of the river. And they also, I mean, what's against them is that they don't spawn very often, and it takes them a long time to be sexually mature, to spawn. It takes the males 15 years before they're sexually mature. It takes the females 20 years before they're sexually mature. So what we did when we ate all of the sturgeon this size, we ate all the teenagers. We consumed them all, and there's no more, there are no more fish to make babies anymore. And so we wanted to reverse that, and we figured, what the heck, let's introduce sturgeon back to the Genesee River. Now, this was in 2003 and 2004. This was an experiment. We tried our best to make sure we were well positioned for success. But you know, we didn't know which direction this was going to go. So we didn't make a big announcement in the news, a big splash, hey, we're reintroducing baby sturgeon because we didn't know for sure if they were even going to survive. Uh, we were hopeful and we did our homework. So in uh, 2003 and 2004, we released almost 2,000 baby sturgeon. They were hatchery reared and we waited and we watched and we watched and we um, were so happy to see they survive. That first year, 85, 95% when we've been checking, survived that first year. And they're only four inches when we let them go. They're really tiny and they survive. What the heck? Sometimes people wonder where we got the baby sturgeon from that we released. And we have a program in Messina, and you all know where Messina is, um, compared to Rochesterians who don't really know up there in the St. Lawrence. But we go to Messina with the DEC and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and we do what's called an egg take. And the egg take is where you invite, well, you net sturgeon, and you invite them into a swimming pool up on the shore, and you uh, also hormone prime them. That's where you give them a little injection, and they can't help themselves but to produce sperm and eggs. And you do it in May when they normally spawn. So we net these fish in Messina, and we put them in the male pool and the female pool. And we, in May, when they spawn, we then get in with them, and we lift them up out of the water. And we, for the females, we hold our hand under a vent here. They just have an exit, a vent, one hole here. And when we lift them out of the water, they can't but help but pass all these caviar eggs. So we get a big stainless steel bowl, lit, put it underneath them, and they pretty much fill it with caviar. Put them back in the pool, and we can usually harvest three big bowls from a female. 
it doesn't hurt, and they normally, they normally will uh, spawn thousands and thousands of eggs. It's normal for them. The reason we hormone prime them is because we really want to time it off because it's all about getting the egg to meet the sperm. And we get the sperm from the males on that left picture. The males are really easy to collect sperm from. You just lift them out of the water, flip them on their back, maybe rub their belly a little bit, and uh, maybe, and they can't help but to shoot sperm straight up to the sky. And that's what we're doing there with that yellow, that white, that syringe with that white fluid in it. It's a 60 ml syringe, super easy to collect the sperm. And the, you may know that fish sperm needs to be contacting water to be capacitated. For the, for the sperm to be active and looking for an egg, you need to add water. So the sperm is really inactive at this point in the syringe. And then what we do is we take the sperm, uh, we take the eggs, this is like a high school biology class, <laughs> but we put them in a bowl. And we get a turkey feather and we stir it up. And we get the sperm to meet the egg. We also put something called Fuller's Earth. It's kind of a clay product. Normally the eggs in the lab, they sink to the bottom and they stick on rocks. They're real sticky. We don't want them to agglutinate with each other. So we put this clay in and it keeps the eggs separated from each other. Add the sperm, we get fertilization, and then we split everything and we take half the, half the embryos to Oneida fish hatchery, and the other half goes to a, a Wisconsin, a, a fish hatchery in Wisconsin. And we will sometimes have 30,000 baby sturgeon through this program. At the hatchery, we have volunteers. We have uh, students volunteer with us, and what we do is we put microchips in each sturgeon, we also will, up there on the top right, we have a scalpel where we take a little scoot off the side of a sturgeon and, this, and it's a little scale that doesn't grow back. So it's a permanent marker. So all of our students who participate, they're, uh, they proudly can tell their parents when they see them over the holidays that they're a sturgeon surgeon. <laughs> uh, pretty cool. We usually do this in uh, October and we release them in October. <clears throat> And uh, we will be releasing them in Rochester because we have a really good program now. We're releasing 1,000 on Monday. Um, Monday, October 15, around 11 a.m., we're going to release 1,000 babies. So we, it's, it's a real community effort. We also have tried some other interesting uh, ways to identify them. The, the microchip system that you inject like you do in your pets is really easy to do. And I think the Watertown Zoo is going to be donating some chips to U.S. Geological Survey for some of our baby sturgeon so that, um, so that Larry can identify them 150 years from now. <laughs> we um, use a yellow tag, it's called a Floyd tag. Floyd tag, this yellow tag has a phone number on it and a unique identifier like a license plate. So when a fisherman might happen to catch one, they give us a call and say, I caught it, we've asked fishermen, we've been working with charter boat captains, we've been working with the whole community. If you catch one of these, take a picture of it, mark that number down, give us a call and we'll let you know who it is and how old it is. And, and, and if you find it far, far away, even better yet, uh, we'll be really impressed. Uh, also, sometimes we find them washed up on the beach. And the same, the same strategy, I usually pick up the dead stinky ones and put them in my car that you guys got the drinks from. <laughs> and they are stinky, by the way. Uh, and I look for a microchip, I look for a scoot mark. And also you can age a sturgeon. They have this pectoral fin right here in the front you can take a little biopsy off the, off, it's a bone, off the leading edge of that pectoral fin. You can take a little slice of that, put it under a microscope, slice it thinly, and you can count like rings in a tree. And you can say how old the fish is. So we always take that leading uh, pectoral fin edge. We also take what's called an otolith. Do you know what an otolith is? So oto is ear, and lith is stone in, in Latin. So it's an ear bone inside your ear. We have otoliths too. The fish have otoliths that if you find, if you know how where to look, put them under a microscope and you can count rings on the otolith and you can see how old it is. So we have many ways to age fish that we otherwise have never handled. And that last one that we tried up there on the right is called an elastomere. It's a little uh, latex injectable that fluoresces under UV light. Uh, we found that doesn't last long enough so we're not doing that anymore. This is what it looks like when you release sturgeon. There are, there are hundreds of baby sturgeon in that big hose. 
uh, enjoying a ride into a big tub on a boat. And this is all the DEC uh, helping us with this big sturgeon release. This is where we release the fish. It's right across from the zoo. It's, that's Veterans Memorial Bridge in Rochester, New York. And this is up the Genesee, about five miles. And we just pretty much go out there on our boat. We have a lot of volunteers. If you come out on Monday, uh, and, uh, and you wave your hand and, 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 and ask nicely, maybe the DEC would let you go on the boat with them. But we go up the river probably about the five miles, and then we have this bathtub of sorts, a well on the boat that has the fish. We pull the, the plug out of the well, and the fish just go down the drain, right to the bottom, and uh, do incredibly well with this 90% survival that first year. So to fast forward, isn't that the cutest thing you ever saw? <laughs> really, when I was at the zoo today, the keepers were melting because they have some babies like that that look just like that. Um, we could look at that for a long time, couldn't we? <laughs> so this is the hatchery root sturgeon. This is what they looked like in 2003, 2004. Just little three to four inch fish. This is how we catch them, and this is how we catch big ones. These are two of my colleagues up on the front of a boat. We drop a net in the river the night before. It looks like a tennis net. And so the sturgeon and a lot of other fish just find their way in the net. Then the next morning, so it's an all night set, and we put like 12 to 14 of these in the Genesee River. Then we come the next morning and we pull the net out, put it in that tub, and whatever fish we find, we identify. And once we capture them, and we use different gauge now to catch different sized fish, uh, we uh, look for the microchip, look for a Floyd tag. In the beginning, we didn't have the finances to put Floyd tags and microchips in every fish, so if they don't have one, we look for the scoot mark. And then we also then we'll put a chip in and a Floyd tag. So we've been identifying them now since 2004 when we've been netting them, and uh, we have about 6,000 fish in the river now that we've been releasing. We take, a, they, we take measurements on them. This is the girth. So you can imagine lifting your arms up, going around your chest. That is the fish girth. We also weigh them. That's a little guy getting weighed. He's a little confused. <laughs> yeah. And they're really hardy. They're totally OK out of the water, totally fine. I mean, they're so chill. When we pull them out of the net, they're, I mean, I'm so anthropomorphic, which I'm loving. I think it's okay to be anthropomorphic. Uh, they are, uh, hello, <laughs> hello. <laughs> they're, they're just so calm, in contrast to carp. Carp are crazy, catfish are crazy. They beat their heads against the boat, they're nuts. Sturgeon are not nuts, they're really chill. This is 2005, we're getting bigger. 2010, yeah, we're getting bigger. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Isn't that like a dinosaur? 85 million years, they're unchanged anatomically. They live with the dinosaurs. There's a really cool children's book I have that I believe is real. <laughs> yeah, but it shows a dinosaur flipping a sturgeon up in the air, eating it. And they did live the same time as dinosaurs, so I'm sure dinosaurs ate them. This is a bigger one and a bigger size and neck that we're that we're untangling mostly. Uh, it's, uh, again, they don't struggle at all. They just say, uh, every day's a new day for a sturgeon, I think, too. They just say, give me out this snack, you know? <laughs> this is 2014, isn't that a beautiful fish? You can see there's a Floyd tag up there in that dorsal, in that, uh, in that fin on the back. We're again doing girth, length, weight. That's how we weigh the big ones. We uh, put a little strap under their pectoral fins and lift them up and and uh, somebody reads the scale as quickly as they can, because uh, they are super heavy. And then we do the girth. These are two volunteers from the Aquarium of Niagara helping us. They're getting bigger. This is Don Detman. She's our wonderful USGS scientist. She's the champion of sturgeon in upstate New York. She works all across upstate New York from, from the St. Lawrence all the way through to Lake, uh, to Lake Erie, really, in Buffalo. And she is our primary, our lead scientist for everything we do at Seneca Park Zoo with sturgeon. This is just across from the zoo. And better yet, this was just a couple of, like a few months ago. Those are two volunteers from Finger Lakes Community College. Those two guys are fishery science students, and this changed their life. They weren't sure what fish they were most interested in, now they know. And this is a male sturgeon. This was in May when they spawned. He let us know he was a male. 
You didn't need any hormone priming to let us know that. If you work with sturgeon, they will oftentimes, and or salmon, they will uh, donate gametes just when you pull them out of the water. So these were boys looking for girls, and uh, those girls were not there. And when, um, when the boys are looking for girls, sometimes they try to try to bring the girls in to, from the lake because they spend their adult life out on the lake, and when they want to spawn, they come back up the river. So that first 10 years of life is in the river, and then 10 to 150 years, it's in the lake, and they go back and forth. Every few years they spawn. But this, uh, this afternoon we had a presentation at the zoo, and so some of you have been to both, so I'm gonna, you're gonna have to suffer through my song again. But the boy sturgeon have a song. And it kind of goes like this. <laughs> yeah, you ready? You ready? So it goes, and then there's a clunk -a clunk -a clunk -a clunk -a Clunk -a clunk -a. So it goes clunk -a clunk -a clunk -a clunk -a. It's like this rap, awesome rap. And the way they make that sound is they have a swim bladder and they pass air through their swim bladder. And they have they don't have the teeth. They have a proboscis. So this is their mouth right here. And when they open their mouth, what they really do when they're feeding is they use these barbels. And this poor fish has lost most of his barbels. But those are where his taste buds are. So he is scooping along the bottom of the river, and they are predators, they aren't scavengers. Uh, and I'll tell you in a second what they eat. But if something tastes good, smells good, whatever the barbels do, they, this proboscis shoots out, and they suck it up, and uh, whatever's in front of them. So when they're singing, they have rocks in their proboscis. Yeah, I don't know how they choose their rocks, but it must be special because the Cornell Ornithology Lab has been putting microphones listening to these sturgeon doing their songs for the females. Uh, so we look forward to next May, and hopefully some of the females will be mature early in life. You never know, they're so healthy. You know how with animals that we manage, sometimes if they have a super healthy life experience, they might mature younger. So we'll see, but we don't expect, now the boys are only 15, so we wouldn't fully expect the females to be spawn, spawning for another five years. Well, what a cool fish, huh? That's a 15-year-old sturgeon. Yeah. <clears throat> what do they eat? That pie chart just really tells you 1% of what they eat. Almost 99% of what they eat are chironomid fly larvae. They're these high lipid little worms. They're, they're fly larvae in the bottom of the river. And there are a lot of them in the Genesee River. And that's explaining why these fish are doing so well. This is their primary diet. Look what else they eat. Yeah, you all know about zebra mussels? You know, they, uh, they're they alien, they're invasive. You know, they didn't volunteer to be here. Uh, we people put them in, they end up getting in our ballast water, going into the Great Lakes. We dump the ballast water out of our boats and we introduce these, these European and Asian invasive species. So zebra mussels found their way into the Great Lakes. They've been quite destructive uh, in many ways. And Mother Nature, because of our introduction of the sturgeon, is trying to reverse that too. So they love to eat zebra mussels. And what else do they eat? Uh, they eat round goby. Now round goby, if you all know about fish, is another one of those alien invasive species. And if you go fishing on any of the piers or the rivers, you're gonna catch a ton of round goby. And they also eat a lot of sport fishing eggs. They are a fun fish for us to have in our Great Lakes. And I was saying earlier today, we normally learn how fish are eating certain diets by passing a tube in their stomach. And then we pull this, whatever's out of their stomach, put it on a screen mesh, and we can see what kind of shell remnants are there, what, what animals they're eating. We have a US Fish, US Fish and Wildlife Service a biologist in, in the lower Niagara who learned that they're eating round goby. And how we learned that is that sometimes when you pull a fish out of the water, they swallow air. And who knows why they swallow air, but that's not a good thing for a fish to do. Because so you try to put them back in the water, and they're not, they're not right. They float, or they're sideways. <laughs> and uh, you know, in a, in a zoo setting, they will eventually pass that gas somehow, and they'll be fine. But in the wild, we're going to put them right back in the river. We don't want them to be uh, floating in the river. So we take the fish, and even with a fish like this, this big, we hold it like this, and we massage it, we go, and we push, 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 push. 
and eventually it goes blah. It's like a big belch. And then you know, great, put him back in the river and down he goes. But my friend in the lower uh, Niagara, when he did that to one of his sturgeon, out popped a round goby. So ta-da, they eat round goby. Who knows how much, but we're very thankful they do that. Now wrapping up, there's just some more information I'd like to share with you more about science. So we have the morphometrics. We know their weight, their length, their girth, their appearance. They are growing as well as fish in unpolluted waters in the Great Lakes, more towards Minnesota and Wisconsin. So in the Genesee River, they're growing tremendously well. So that alone makes us really happy. But we were able to, through the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, get a grant, about $300,000, to study the chemical contaminants, the pollutants in the blood system of these fish. Now, if I collected blood from you guys, I'd be able to tell what your past history was with mercury, with PCBs. You can see what kind of pollutants are in, in your body. Nowadays, there's even a cooler way to tell if you have mercury, and that's by looking at a hair sample. So we're trying to figure out a way to maybe take a fin sample on the fish to find that out. But if you take a hair sample on a person, you can tell what day or what month, depending on how they know how your hair grows, when you were exposed to the mercury. And that's being very, that's very useful now in the Seychelles near Madagascar where we're studying fish that are being consumed that are high in mercury. We can tell what season that they're consuming these fish and give more advice on how to eat them safely. But anyway, we figured why not invite our fish to donate some blood samples to us. Now if you do normal sampling of fish for chemical contaminants, you've got to grind them up into a mush. So you kill the fish and then you examine the levels in the mush. Well, we wanted to treat our fish much nicer than that, so we asked them for blood samples. And you take a blood sample like from us here, you take a blood sample from sturgeon somewhere else, and I'll show you in a sec. We also selfishly wanted to know what kind of impact what our findings will tell us about fish consumption advisories. The New York State Department of Health advises certain at-risk people to eat no fish from Lake Ontario. No fish, doesn't matter what it is. And those are usually women of childbearing age and children. No fish. Men, mm, you know, we maybe have a meal or so a week. It, like, we're, I guess, disposable, you know? <laughs> but not the women of childbearing age and the kids. So we wanted to understand how can these fish tell us what kind of chemical contaminants they are absorbing. And remember, we don't eat these fish. We don't eat these fish. Really quickly, I mentioned PCBs. This is a chemical, and we all have these screening values and cancer health endpoints, non-cancer health endpoints. There's data now that knows how these chemicals adversely affect people. And for each one of these chemicals, we know that they persist, and we know that they are unhealthy, and we also know they're fat soluble. So you know I was telling you that they love those chironomid fly larvae? Those are really high fat. So our Genesee River fish have really high lipid values. They probably could benefit from some cholesterol lowering drugs probably, Lipitor might be a good idea. <laughs> but you know what that made, meant for us? Uh, we have a control river that we were examining, I'll go through these, but the control river, they weren't fatty fish. They didn't eat all these high fat uh, larvae. So we had to factor that in when we were doing our measurements because our fish were fatty. Dioxin furans, I mentioned, they also are combustion byproducts. They're endocrine disruptors too. We know that men who consume fish high in uh, dioxins and PCBs, their sperm isn't quite right. Their sperm motility is a little off. So their swimmers aren't swimming so well, and it really does reduce their uh, reproduction potential. And also the morphology of the sperm isn't quite right either. And so, and also there's this feminization uh, in utero of, of, of babies with this endocrine disruption. It's kind of weird, and we've seen that in fish, where fish, um, their gonads aren't quite right. Uh, so this is a big question we have, not just for the fish, but for people and their health. There's my friend Myrex, that insecticide that is, thank you, hooker chemical. And I mentioned mercury is the national number one reason why we have fish consumption advisories. Cadmium is a heavy metal, it persists in your bone. So once you get it, you've got it forever. Nickel, similar heavy metal. Silver, yay, Kodak. 
Again, this doesn't have any health problems, though. Where's our control river? We have to have a control river. We know we've got our polluted river. We need a control river. The control river is the Oswegatchie. Do you know the Oswegatchie? It's up there by Ogdensburg, up by the St. Lawrence. It's a river that doesn't have this long history of pollution. So that's our control fish. Just so happens we've been releasing fish there as well. So we had 10-year-old fish. We were looking at 10-year-old fish that were age-matched, that were hatchery-reared, that were released in that river. So what a good scientific experiment. We've got the fish that grew up in the toxic hotspot and the fish that grew up in, in the healthier water system. There's the Genesee River. Isn't that beautiful? Now that's the upper Genesee. That's Rochester, New York. There's the Oswegatchie. Yahoo. Yeah. So we went out on both of those river systems and we were collecting fish in nets just like we did in the Genesee. And we were taking blood samples from them. And that's how we did it with these tubes. We had students and volunteers. It's easy to learn how to take blood samples on a sturgeon. Any of you could do it in 30 seconds. You'd, you'd be awesome. Jackie is a vet tech at Utica. You know how when you have a vet try to take a blood sample or you try to take a blood sample and sometimes it just doesn't happen? I don't know why that is. Well, 100% of the time it happens. And you can't help yourself but want to keep taking more blood because it's going so well. But you stop. And, <laughs> And it's really fun, and that's a close-up. It's just a vacuum tuner tube and a needle. You go straight in the ventral midline, and voila, they have this beautiful cobble thing. What about our results? So remember, we're comparing these bad chemicals in the blood of both river systems. What we were hoping is that the chemicals in our river, in our fish, in the blood of our fish, in our river, uh, weren't elevated. We were hoping that our fish and the Genesee River have the same kind of blood levels of contaminants as our healthy river. That would make us feel better that the two rivers are the same and not polluted, our river. Well, we were worried, 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 worried. Good news, it's true. Our river's fine with, in regard to these chemicals that were measured. Our fish tell us that the two rivers are exactly the same. Statistically, there's no difference in the chemicals that we were concerned with. And this is, these are just some graphs that show you that statistically, between the two river systems, Oswegatchie is blue, Genesee is orange, that there is no significant difference in the blood values for PCBs, for dioxins and furans, same thing. And it gets a little more interesting here with heavy metals. So for cadmium, the same. Yeah, no big deal, cadmium is, is one of those fish consumption advisory, so that's making us feel good. Mercury, the same. And that kind of makes sense, because mercury came from the air. It didn't come from Rochester industry. It came from the air. So you kind of expect that to be the same. Nickel, the Genesee's higher. And nickel doesn't have any fish, consum fish consumption advisory numbers. It's not a health problem. And we weren't surprised at that, because that's more with the metal plating industry and some of the industry we knew we had in the river. So we know, we know that we've really validated that this system works. We also, we looked at fillet in some of the fish because we did find some dead fish, trying to see how the blood levels would correlate with fillet. And those were all pretty interesting too. Uh, silver, even though it's a little tiny bar chart over there, was elevated in the Genesee River. That didn't surprise us. We expected that. This is what we did not expect. You know our friend Myrex, the insecticide, uh, the flame retardant that came from Hooker Chemical in the Niagara River. Why in the world would our fish in the Genesee have higher levels of Myrex? There is no way in the world we were producing Myrex in Rochester or anywhere south of Rochester. No point source at all. But our fish, compared to the Oswegatchie, were loaded with Myrex. So we thought about that. We were sampling fish from the whole six miles of our Genesee River. The Genesee River flows north, so it's like flushing northward. So you wouldn't expect, really, that the Myrex would get into the river. We thought, well, there might be a possibility. Sometimes, like when we were out on the river a couple of weeks ago, we had these rollers, these water, these waves that were rolling in from Lake Ontario about three miles. And it was kind of tough to get our boat through them. So maybe the wave action was bringing Myrex in. That might be kind of far-fetched. Then we uh, looked at a master, somebody did a master's thesis on salmon, and the, you know how salmon are, are running right now, and when salmon spawn, 
They go up the river system and they die, unlike the sturgeon. They die and they drop to the bottom of the river and they are loaded with Myrex. So remember, this is a persistent chemical. So when you get that, all that Myrex in the salmon goes up the river, does its spawning and then drops down to the bottom. Now you're introducing salmon to the sediment. Uh, that made us super happy because it, it's all about what did Rochester put in the river in that case. And so since it's not our, it's a lake wide cause, it's not a Rochester cause, that one's off the table. So we have really good news about what our fish have told us. And for that reason, now the DEC wants to keep introducing fish to our river through 2023. And we're releasing 1,000 a year. We've released about 6,000 so far. And we're, tracking, all, we're, tra we're tracking them all throughout uh, uh, the next probably 20 years. A lot of community outreaches is when Seth looked better, uh, with a better tail and a better fin. But you know, it's about getting kids involved and uh, all over the community, be at the zoo, be at the medical school, anywhere there's an audience, we're talking about these wonderful fish. And we're also engaging citizen scientists, citizen scientists to help us release the fish, to be involved with caring about the fish. And what we're looking forward to big time is 2020, 2023, we're going to have what we call sturgeon stewards. These are gonna be volunteers like you guys coming down to the Genesee River in May and protecting these big fish when they're spawning because they'll be in very shallow waters and their mind is elsewhere. And if somebody really wanted to pull a sturgeon out of the water, they're so chill that uh, you could pick them up and they wouldn't resist that much. So we are going to have more citizen scientists involved, not just releasing the babies, but involved with protecting the spawning. And our zoo is wonderful in Rochester promoting this story. Watertown Zoo is promoting the story with the little baby sturgeon. Uh, we um, we uh, have sturgeon in a stream. We have sturgeon in our tank at the zoo. Uh, the sturgeon now at Watertown Zoo, they are only like this big. And that's how big these were when they started. And when they get to be about that size, we give them back to the DEC and they release them. And they give us three more little babies. And they usually last a few years in our tank system. But how cool is that? And these sturgeon, I know I might be a little wacky on sturgeon, but they interact with the kids. They will follow a kid's finger along the stream, along the front of the glass. And they will also approach you if they get a chance. Uh, and the Shedd Aquarium is the best place to check that out. They have a great lake swing in Chicago. They have a sturgeon touch tank with fish this big. You lean over and they come up to you and they turn and they're like, rub my belly. And, and then they'll move like there. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> they love to interact with people. These are the sturgeon in our stream at the zoo. And we have weigh-ins and we celebrate the growth of our sturgeon in the stream. This is an outdoor stream that, that uh, is, is, is uh, year-round. We also got a grant through the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative to connect storm drain health with sturgeon health. Anything that we can do to help improve our waterways and uh, because we now love our sturgeon so much, no one would dare put oil or paint down those storm drains because this going to hurt Seth and his cousins. The, um, the challenge we faced with, uh, I don't know if I brought it with me or not, but the challenge we faced with, uh, with um, not repeating the same mistakes we made when we ate all of our sturgeon back around the turn of the century uh, was we wanted to make sure we got the word out. Let them go if you catch them. Uh, they're illegal to possess. This is the DEC sign. It's a metal sign. It's a beautiful metal sign that's at, that's at boat launches, it's on trees. Uh, and we learned, interestingly, that our metal signs were disappearing at the fish access sites. And they weren't only just disappearing, we've learned that fishermen were frying fish on them at the fish access sites. At the fish access sites. Oh. So we were curious about that. We learned that, uh, yeah, that happens, especially with uh, subsistence anglers uh, and others. So we had to get away around that. And uh, so we had some volunteers uh, think about how can we get the word out uh, in a better way? And so they came up with stenciling. So we graffiti the heck out of Rochester. And we have volunteers that are stenciling our fishing access sites, and they're everywhere. This is one of our boat launches. This is a really only city boat launch in Rochester. They're on those, they're, um, they're everywhere. This is the Rochester Harbor. 
and uh, I had one in my driveway <laughs> because I was test driving it. They're everywhere. We have them at the zoo, uh, and um, we usually get permission to put them places, but we're calling it you know, graffiti and this good stuff, and we're getting the word out. We also learned that there are some at-risk community members that may not speak English. And we uh, learned that uh, there's a Russian contingency that comes up from New York City uh, that is uh, catching salmon right now in the lower Genesee. And so we thought, what the heck? Let's put some signs out in Russian. And then we thought also, what the heck? We've got a wonderful, wonderful Burmese refugee community in Rochester that are subsistence anglers. anglers. They truly, truly don't have a, a choice, an alternative for a protein source. It, it, it's not their fault, and you can't like shake your finger at somebody who's, who needs that protein. But we have these signs now in Burmese, we have them in Spanish, and we are building relationships with those communities. We're hoping for spawning in 2020. This is where they'll be spawning, right here in those shallow waters off of Seth Green Island. My new job at the zoo is I'm an environmental, I guess I'm the, <laughs> The environmental justice advocate. It sounds kind of weird. Nobody knows what that means. I think it's. I just tell them it's a superhero, and, and well, let's just accept that. But an environmental justice advocate is really promoting awareness of environmental justice. It's where you have vulnerable communities that are overrepresented, overburdened by environmental degradation, by pollution, for example. Where they happen to live in the city is a polluted area. Let's say they also live in an area that's what's called a food desert. There really aren't grocery stores. And they really are, not by their own choice, but they're stuck there. And that's environmental justice, where they really uh, don't benefit from the environmental services we do. And so we're building <coughs> relationships with the refugee community. And uh, so I teach English on Tuesdays with our refugee community, bringing our sturgeon with me. And these are some of the kids. I'm working mostly with the adults. And we're also out teaching citizenship classes. Uh, in the evenings with our refugee communities. And we just had a protocol approved through the University of Rochester School of Medicine where we're working with a fish flashcard survey where we have two piles of these big photographs of fish they might catch. One pile is, no, I don't catch it, eat it, uh, and yes, I do. And we are going to learn more about not just if they're eating sturgeon, but what kind of fish they may be eating, especially if there are some high-risk fish like carp and catfish that are super contaminated and maybe look at alternatives to those fish consumptions and alternatives somehow to maybe even reverse poverty. So we've been working through the medical school at the University of Rochester and the whole undergraduate campus. We now have access points for hiring refugees. And we have three departments that are hiring. Uh, they have to meet certain criteria, but we're trying our darn just to build good relationships, not judging, but recognizing that there's a risk eating fish and also let's for sure let our sturgeon go if we happen to catch one by this too. What's coming up, we just got funding for telemetry tracking our sturgeon. I'm pretty excited about this because from a science angle, it's the same kind of technology that we're working in Canada. We're working in Lake Erie. We're looking in the Lower Nine working. It's all the same equipment. So through this telemetry tracking, which involves a little, little sturgeon surgery, we, make a little, we put a little incision in them and put an in, a, a telemetry device inside the fish and then let them go. And for the big fish, we can put an external tracker on them. Uh, and we're going to know where our fish are going. We know because they have microchips in them, they've made it to the Niagara Falls from Rochester. They made it all the way over to Lower Niagara, and they made it close to Oswego. So they're out there, and now we'll learn more what they do coming and going from the Genesee River. So I'm super excited about this telemetry tracking, which is going to happen next year. <clears throat> and we're also working with endocrine disruption. I mentioned to you what that happened, how that happens with chemicals. But also it can happen with fish. And you know a lot about sperm morphology and motility. Well, if it's going to happen with humans, let's see if it's first happening with our fish. And remember how fish donate sperm? It's pretty darn easy. So we've got our samples, and I'm working with the androgen lab at the university. This is the assisted reproduction lab at the medical school, where if families are having problems getting pregnant, that uh, we can work medically to advance that. So the people that are working with human sperm are pretty jazzed about working with our sturgeon sperm. And if you've looked under a microscope at what sperm looks like, at least sturgeon sperm is very different from the sperm I've seen under a microscope. 
sperm normally has a little round head, you know, and a little tail, and they're unstoppable. Uh, sturgeon sperm are unstoppable as well, but their head is like a little boxy thing. Yeah, they're like blockheads. <laughs> and uh, they get them down, though. So we're going to be able to look at the anatomy, at the morphology, at the motility of our sturgeon sperm compared to control sperm that haven't been uh, in fish exposed to chemical contaminants. Uh, but in the end, you know, we have the science that's helping us. In the end, we want to really, truly promote a conservation message, an ecosystem health message. We've got 21% of the world's surface freshwater to protect. It's a beautiful resource. And we really need to work with local communities to care about that resource, care about the animals that are in that resource, and care about ecosystem health. The only way we're going to do that is with future generations. Uh, instilling hope in parents and grandparents that their children are going to have a better life, a healthy life, a life that has healthy water systems and healthy, healthy ecosystem. So through all of our efforts, get the word out, wear your sticker proudly, promote healthy sturgeon, healthy fish, healthy waters, and uh, a healthy ecosystem. So thank you all for coming tonight, and uh, it's been my pleasure being here.